Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the RAL seminar series. Uh, my name is Jared Lee, and I'm the RAL seminar coordinator. And um, we're, we'll be rebooting the RAL seminar series. Uh, and I'll be sending out an email to RAL everyone tomorrow with some more information about that. Um, you know, recruiting new, uh, new speakers for upcoming seminars and just kind of going over uh, what our plans are as we reboot the seminar series um, for the next few months while we're virtual and then hopefully as a transition back to the office happens. So now I'm going to hand it over to Mike Eck to introduce our speaker. Mike. Hey, hello everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Eric Gilliland. Uh, he's part of the Joint Numerical Testbed Program in RAL. And uh, he's our resident um, expert statistician um, uh, in, well, all things statistical, uh, working with us meteorologists, earth scientists, and others. And uh, he's got a lot of experience with ex extreme values as well, looking at uh, extreme conditions. Uh, and today, he's going to talk about a new spatial alignment summary measure for high-resolution gridded forecast verification. So I will, uh, and you can go have a look at M. Eric's webpage if you want, because a lot of this uh, other information is spelled out there. So I will turn it over to you, Eric, now, and you uh, may proceed. Thank you again for uh, agreeing to this seminar. Thanks, Mike, and thanks for uh, everybody for showing up. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, I'm going to talk about a new uh, summary measure for spatial forecast verification um, that I've been working on this past year. Uh, I won't go into a whole lot of background on why we do spatial verification because I think most of you um, are familiar with that. But basically, you know, you've got these higher resolution models and it's really hard to beat the coarser resolution models uh, with the traditional methods. And there are different reasons for that. Um, you know, for example, if your forecast is perfect, like in this example here, um, you, you get penalized once for all these misses, but then you get penalized again for all these false alarms. And so there's the double penalty and then there are other issues as well. Um, uh, another kind of caveat that we don't often talk about and I usually don't talk about um, is this idea of, you know, observations are a lot of times only available at point locations and how do you then compare those to the grid? And um, mostly what we do is, you know, we get an analysis and so that we have the observations on a grid and if we need to regrid, you know, rescale things so that they're on the same grid, um, then we do so. And everything I'm gonna talk about today or most everything is going to assume that we have a forecast and an observation both on the same grid. And uh, I am going to divert a little bit and talk about this issue of the point observation to the gridded forecast only because it helps to introduce uh, the method that I'm going to be talking about. Um, in order to combat the traditional verification problems with the higher resolution models, a whole bunch of methods were introduced. And I won't go into what they all are. Uh, but there are a few things that are helpful, I think, to talk about at, re regarding them. And uh, one is that most of the methods that are popular now or that get used, the first thing you do is you um, I turn the forecast into a binary field. So you know, maybe you set a threshold and everything above the threshold is one and everything below is zero. Um, for example, the fraction skill score, which is a very popular method, you first create a binary field and then smooth it. Um, same with the intensity scale verification method, which is a wavelet based approach. Um, you, same thing, you uh, first convert the fields into binary, and then you do the wavelet decomposition on that. Um, if you want to get at intensity information, obviously, you know, you can do that indirectly by setting different thresholds. Um, but if you wanted to do it just all in one fell swoop, you pretty much have to do one of these methods down at the bottom here. Um, there's probably a lot of people are familiar with mode, which was developed here at NCAR. 
um, where, where you try to identify features in the field. And a lot of times in doing that, you set the fields to binary um, in order to identify those features. Um, and then the intensity gets informed in a nice way um, on a feature by feature basis, but in a distributional sense on those features. Um, and then really the, this kind of, so, so I'll talk a little bit about the feature base just in case you're not familiar with mode. But you know, you identify these features in, in a given field, and then you can kind of decide: Do I want to merge a couple of features? Like, you know, maybe they're uh, very close together, so maybe I want to think of these two here as one feature. Um, and then, once you have those features uh, and any mergings developed uh, in one field, then you want to do the same in the other field, and you want to. Um, you know, then match the features, you know, or not, and maybe they, maybe some features are not matched and, and some are. Um, so one of the reasons I, I wanted to harp on the binary uh, idea is that I get, a, I get a lot of flack every single time I write a paper <laughs> or, or just, you know, you go to a conference at, at the recent uh, international verification methods workshop. This was, it was brought up not even while I was on um, that there are some people who really beat the drum that they, they don't like this binarization of the fields that you lose information. And so I, I'll talk a little later in this talk about that a, a little more, but, um, but I think you actually get a lot of information out of the alignment part of of uh, these measures, because at, at some point, a lot of times you calibrate a forecast, in which case, um, you know, when you do a distributional type of summary of the intensity performance, if they're well calibrated, you're going to do really well. Um, so everything, all these summary measures that I'm going to talk about today um, are, you know, so they're based on the binary field. And, and there's summaries over the entire field. And you could though, so with these feature-based methods, you often need to um, compare the individual features in some way. And a lot of times you, you wanna do that based on how well they align. So all, all of these distance-based measures that I'm gonna talk about today, um, you could just do on individual feature comparisons. And um, one thing that I just realized I need to say <laughs> is that these distance-based measures that I'm talking about today are all in MET, um, except for the new ones that I'm going to present. And I'm hoping that we'll get them into MET um, before too long. And so really, if you, if you want to do, if you want to handle this, these problems about the traditional measures, Ideally, you do a feature-based method. And um, for example, uh, so here you have a forecast that looks remarkably like um, Johann Lindstrom and an observation that looks remarkably like another person I know named Finn Lindgren. And so it turns out that Johann is a forecast for Finn. And so before I do my root mean squared error or whatever measure I wanna do, um, I want to make Johan's face align a little better with Finn's face so that I can get like the eyes to eyes and the nose and the, and everything, um, and then do these intensity comparisons. And, and that's great. And that's kind of what you want to do, but the problems that, but there are several problems. One is kind of related with the feature-based approach like mode where you know, you have to identify the features and then merge them and match them. And, you know, and how do you, you know, there are different ways to do that and you can get different solutions. The same is true with image warping. You, you know, you couldn't, uh, you know, there, there's no unique warp that's optimal. And then the other end of it, um, which I suppose you also have with mode, um, is that then you have to decide, okay, we had to move the points around this much and, and then the intensity error is this, but you know, how do I compare that with another warp where I moved it a different amount and the intensity errors are a different amount? You know, which one's better? 
and so um, my point is just that it's complicated and you know mode is much easier and i think that's partly why it's um, so, so well received and um, but what these summary measures that i'm that i'm going to talk about they're very simple um, and especially if you just apply to the entire field you know there's no merging or matching it's just you know, you get the summary of, you know, how well do they align and match up. Um, so as I promised, just a little bit more about the intensity errors. Um, every method that does anything with intensity errors, it's going to be a distributional summary, unless it's image warping, you know, or a different field deformation approach where you move them and then you do your direct accounting um, and then mode is an exception in the sense that it's like the in the it's like the field deformation so i'll put that in that same category um, but other methods that have been proposed it's like you know you either compare the means over the whole field um, a qq plot like this takes the ranks from one field and plots them against the ranks from the other field so for example this is a nice straight line here and um, which says that they're pretty pretty good in terms of intensity errors, but it doesn't tell you that you completely missed Northern Germany um, with all this activity that's up here. And it doesn't say anything about the fact that you wouldn't want to mix and match what's happening in these mountainous areas in Central Europe with what's happening up in Northern Germany. Um, and so it's just to kind of keep that in mind uh, about distributional summaries of intensity. Um, and then I already mentioned about the calibration part. Um, so now I, I earlier promised again that um, I would talk a little bit about verifying when you have point locations against a set of points. So against a gridded forecast where maybe you've set it to binary by you know setting everything above a threshold. Um, so maybe this is a some kind of a you know zero visibility or some kind of situation like that where this A is. Um, it's very easy to take a single point. So what I'm calling S naught here, um, which is just a coordinate, you know, um, you could think of it as long lat. Everything I'm going to be talking about, I'm assuming just X, Y, because and there's a reason for that that I'll go into, but um, it's very easy to say how far away is this point from the set A. There are different things you could do, but the most straightforward, the simplest thing to do is just what is the shortest distance to the nearest point in the set? And for notation, I call that D of S naught comma A. So, so A is a whole set of points and S naught is a single coordinate in, in the domain, which I use a script D um, for that. So, oh, and just to, um, point out, there is a recent paper where they do something kind of like this, uh, where they have a single point and they're looking out at um, the nearest forecast um, event. Um, they do something a little different though, but uh, just to reference that there. And, and this will be recorded. So if you, if you can't get your screen capture in time, you, know, you can go back, um, but what I like to do is go another step. Um, so you have your point, you have your shortest distance to your event. You can also calculate the bearing, right? Which is just a reference I use, I think you usually use north. Um, and that's what my software <laughs> uses as the reference. So uh, it's just, you draw this line straight up to north and then you have, you have your line of shortest distance to the nearest point in the set. And then that angle here is your bearing. And so uh, I think that adds a nice little extra piece of information. Um, for example, what we're seeing here is a uh, dust visibility and where it's black is where you have zero visibility. So I'm gonna think of that uh, just for this example, I'm gonna think of that as zero visibility. So like this station here is in that zero visibility zone and then these other two are kind of nearby. Um, so I can calculate the distance from every point in this grid to where there's an event. Um, and if I do that, I get a distance map that would look like this here. 
but I just have these three observing locations, uh, one of which has a zero distance, so I didn't do a bearing. Um, and then these others are, are close to where it is, but, and then they have a different angle to the nearest point. And if we collect all these distances and the angles, um, then we can make a nice uh, circle histogram. And if you're a meteorologist, you uh, might be familiar with a Windrose diagram. And that's all a circle histogram is. It's just instead of having your wind direction with the wind speed or whatever on the pedals, um, the, the angles are the bearing from one station to the other, or from the station in this case to the nearest dust event. Um, if you had greater distances in this, in the example that I have from here, there, these distances um, were all within the first bin, basically. Uh, I, I suppose I could have made it more colorful, but you'd, you'd have different colors if you had more categories to look at. Um, but for example, you can see at this station, the vast majority of the times that there's a dust event, it's off at this angle, uh, at this bearing. Um, so it gives you, you know, a little more information. Um, this last piece is kind of a side <laughs> note, but I just, um, it, I, I, I don't know, I, I just wanted to talk about it. <laughs> so, um, so that's comparing a single point to a grid observation. But what we want to do is compare sets of points to sets of points, which it turns out is much more difficult to do, at least to do sensibly. And um, so, for example, we might take a point in B and we can calculate that shortest distance to a point in A and we can do it for every point in B. And if we do it for every point in B, and just give me a moment here, there we go. Yeah, if we do it for every point in B, we could take the average of those distances. And if we do that, we get something called the mean error distance. Um, and I did a paper on that a few years back. Um, but you can see it's just the average of these shortest distances from points in just the set B to the points in to the nearest point in the sets in the set A, and um, and then it's just divided by the number of points that we're uh, that we're averaging over. Um, and so obviously that's uh, asymmetric. I'll, there's going to be another slide on that one. But we might also think about taking distances from points in the set A to the nearest point in the set B. And it turns out if we take the maximum of all of the distances from, a, from B to A and from A to B, then we get something called the Hausdorff distance. And that's, um, so both the Hausdorff, Hausdorff distance and the mean error distance are, they were both, uh, proposed in, in binary image comparison literature, you know, from a long, long time ago. And um, Hausdorff distance is very well known. Uh, mean error distance they never liked because it's not symmetric and, and um, which I'll talk about in a couple of slides here. Um, but yeah, so before I do that, I wanna talk a little more about these uh, distance maps. So again, you have your binary fields. And so on the top here, I have three different um, fake binary fields. So a circle, a bigger circle, and then a ring. Um, they all have the same center here. And so the distance maps are just every single grid point, you calculate a distance, the shortest distance from that grid point to the nearest event. And, and so you can see what those look like with that. Um, so the mean error distance, you can think about masking out some of that distance map. And uh, so for example, for the mean error distance between the small circle and the big circle, uh, I take the big circle and I mask out the distance map for that smaller circle. And so I'm taking an average of everything in here inside this big ring. And that's the MED C1, C9. Now, if I do the MED for C9, C1, now I'm masking out the distance map for the large circle and, and uh, calculating everything inside this gray dashed circle. So I just put that there to remind you where the smaller circle was. 
So you can see without knowing the actual values that the mean error distance is zero for that one because this small circle is completely contained in the large circle. Um, and so the point of that is that it's not symmetric. And so they didn't like it in the binary image literature when it was proposed for, I think largely just for that reason. But um, in, the, in the paper that I, I did, I, I argued that that's actually a really useful thing in, um, in, in the forecast verification application because it gives you a sense of misses versus false alarms. Okay. Uh, so I think that's all I needed to say about that. Uh, and then here's just an example with using real uh, precipitation data in this case. Uh, it's not, I, I didn't do a very good job with the color scaling here. I tried to fix it before the talk, but I, I wasn't getting anywhere. <laughs> so imagine, you know, these precipitation fields, the raw sort of fields up at the top. And then I set a threshold and, and create a binary field and that's in the middle. And then on the bottom, you get these distance maps. And so it turns out if I take the magnitude difference between these two fields, I get this field over here. And it turns out if I take the maximum of this field, I get the Hausdorff distance. So we already saw we can get the mean error distance using these distance maps. And we can get the Hausdorff distance using them. And just the point of that is that there's a fast algorithm to compute these distance maps. And that allows us to do all these summaries very quickly. Um, and another metric that I'll discuss a little bit um, is Badley's delta metric. And basically you have those distance maps. Okay, so that's those are those shortest distances from a single grid point to the nearest point in the set. Um, and, but you do it for the whole grid. And so the so the so you can think of these as the distance maps. There's an additional cutoff function that you know I usually set the constant to infinity, so I, I usually don't have this cutoff function when I do it. Um, but that's just to try to um, ameliorate some of the problems, which I'll talk about later um, with the with the badly measure. Um, note that the sum here is over the entire domain. Um, so where the mean error distance is just over sets within the field, this one is over the entire domain. Um, and then there's a user selectable parameter, this P. And you know, basically, if you set it's an LP norm, so if you set P equal to one, you get an average of the of this difference here. If you set P equal to two, you get the Euclidean norm. Um, and if you set P equal to infinity. Um, or you know, you take the limit as it goes to infinity, you uh, wind up with the maximum of this. And so assuming you do like I do and you don't use the cutoff function, then you get the Hausdorff distance back out of it. Um, and similarly, you could go to the negative infinity and get the minimum um, if you wanted to. Okay, so those are all kind of old hat stuff. Those are the things in MET and, um, and uh, and so now I'm gonna talk about the new measure. And to do that, I think, even though I didn't do an animation, so you have to look at everything all at once, <laughs> let's not look at all of it right now, um, but just to get some of the notation um, and I have to just sit up here to see. So uh, I have my set A and my set B, uh, all this light blue stuff, including this part out here, and just to emphasize it doesn't have to be contiguous. Um, all this light blue stuff is where A intersects where B is not there. So A intersect B complement. And then the next shade of up of blue uh, shows me the intersection between points that are not in A, but are in B. And, um, and then the darkest blue is where they intersect. So you have the A intersect B. And then of course your correct negatives, you could say are the intersection of A complement and B complement. Um, and then, so if I do N and then, so, and then I, in the subscript, put the name of the set, uh, it's just the number of points that are in that set. So like a, NAB is the number of points in A intersect B. Um, so then uh, I'm, I actually have two measures and, and I'll explain why there are two. But um, 
they they consist of this product y, which which is just the product of two summaries. The first summary is the number of points in a in, in the light blue a intersect b complement and the next shade up a complement b, which is the also known as the symmetric difference. So it's just the number of points that are in in each of the sets where where the they're not in the other set, and uh, so it's kind of a measure of the amount of overlap or the lack of overlap, if you prefer. So if you have a perfect match, then Y1 will be zero. Um, and then Y2 is just a, it's essentially a sum of the mean error distance um, calculated in both directions, right? Because of the lack of symmetry, um, except that I temper it by the number of points in the set. And the rationale there is that if there aren't many points in B, I don't want to overly, you know, penalize the forecast for, you know, for having, you know, just so many points. And, and, and there's another reason for that, which, um, you know, may become clear later. Okay, so what it is, so this Y is a product of an area. So that's the number of points in the symmetric difference. And, so, so an area of like lack of overlap multiplied by how far away are the, are the, is that lack of overlap? You know, how bad is it? And so you have an area, which is grid points, the units are grid points squared, and then the distances are in grid points. So it's, um, so, so the units of Y would be grid points cubed. So that's the reason for G being Y to the one third power that puts it into grid point units. So the Hausdorff distance, the Baddeley delta, the mean error distance, they're all in units of grid points. Um, and what I'm going to talk about mostly here and, and is this second measure. And that was the original one that I proposed, the main one that I, that I wanted to introduce. Um, it has a user selectable parameter. And there were a couple of reviewers who just really didn't like that it had a user selectable parameter, um, which is kind of strange because it's the same idea in part of mode, you know, that you have these, um, this sort of fuzzy logic uh, part for all the different attributes and modes. So in mode, you have all kinds of these parameters, but um, it was a problem here. I, you know, I don't know why, um, but anyway, I won't, <laughs> I won't is right too much more about that. Um, but what I wanted, I wanted a measure that was just from zero to one, an index, where zero meant that it's really bad and one meant means that it's perfect. So if you have a perfect match, this ends up being one. Um, I'll talk about how you select beta, but it's basically, you know, you have these grid points cubed for this Y. And so it's basically trying to take away the units in a sense. And then the max between this quantity and zero is just so that it's between zero and one. Okay. And I should check the time. Okay. Good. So um, the first thing to think about in terms of selecting beta, um, at the top here, I have a blue circle, which is you partially can't see because of the gray outlines of circles over top of it. But if I think about that as sort of just like a, a stationary circle, and then I keep translating it further and further out to the right, then um, I'm going to compare the blue circle with each one of these gray circles. So just in same circle, just increasing translations. And then I calculate, and you can ignore this figure of merit on the right. It, if, you, if you read my paper, you'll learn about that as well. But I'm not, I'm not going to talk about it here, though, just for time. Um, but on the left here is this uh, G beta score for different values of beta. And basically, if you take beta large, so N cubed, for example, so this capital N I'm taking as the size of the domain. So that's like the full number of grid points. Um, and so, you know, if you took that N squared, um, because, you know, so that's a very large value, <laughs> is my point. You can see that it, it's going to give almost a perfect score. These are actually slightly less than one, but um, 
almost a perfect score for every one of these translations. So that's too high. So you don't want to choose a score that's really high. Um, for, for more moderate values, it basically just decreases linearly at some point. Once the circle um, is no longer overlapping, it, it just decreases linearly. And so the lower the beta, the, the faster it decreases to zero. And so for a small choice of beta, um, it decreases very quickly to zero. Um, for most of the examples I'm going to show, I'm using this n squared over two. And you know, it basically depends on the size of the domain relative to the scale of the features you're looking at. Um, so for these geometric cases I'm going to be showing, um, I just liked n squared over two. It, it's not super sensitive, you know, for moderate values of, of beta, but um, it just seemed like a good choice there. Um, so some of what you can look at is in terms of identifying beta, you know, the maximum value for this symmetric dis difference is the size of the domain, um, which is capital N, right? And that, that happens if you're, um, you know, like you, well, well, we'll see an example where it happens. So, um, and then the maximum value for Y2 kind of depends on what distance map you choose exactly, but it's going to be on the order of, you know, about N squared times something. Okay. Um, and so if you multiply those together, that's where I was getting that N cubed um, as just like a really big value. So you want it to be smaller than that. Um, okay, so using the n squared over two, I'm going to go into um, a bunch of test cases we created somewhat recently, and um, you can see all these in this paper, which has uh, free access. Uh, it's in MWR, um, and we basically came up with a bunch of new test cases to test out primarily these distance-based measures. Um, one of which is when there's absolutely nothing in the field. So the field is empty. And it turns out that that's a real problem for a lot of the measures that had come before. Um, usually, you know, they're defined to be infinity. And, and so then you say, well, just choose a big value like the size of the domain. Um, but so these two new measures that I came up with here both give perfect scores. So G is a perfect score if it's zero and again, G beta is a perfect score if it's one. So this other case is if every single value in the domain is one, right? And, um, and, and so if you compare P1 with P2, you want to have a bad score um, and you don't want it to be undefined. You, you want it to be a bad score. And that's what you get from both of these new measures. Um, all of the other measures had some kind of difficulty with our pathological cases. Um, but then if we go, uh, let's say we had an empty field, but, you know, maybe a little bit of noise shows up. So maybe a single grid point turns on a lot of those measures, they might be undefined or they might be defined and give a large value, but then you put a single point in and suddenly it's a really good, you know, forecast. So, um, you know, if, you, if both fields are empty or almost empty, you want to get a good score, right? Uh, is my thinking on that. Um, but so if we add a single value or maybe a few values, you know, what do we get? And for example, if you compare this P6 to P7 here, they both have the same centroid. So the centroid distance is zero, which is a perfect score according to centroid distance. And I, I, I'm going to, you know, a lot of these test cases that we came up with, I, I was picking on the centroid distance. So you're going to see a lot of examples where you get a perfect score from centroid distance uh, when you maybe don't want to. Um, so that, yeah, I show that. Uh, so again, you know, these new values, you get nearly zero, but not they're not perfect. So it's not going to be exactly zero for G. And for G beta, it's going to be nearly one, but not exactly one. Um, you know, when you round to even a few de decimal places, you get one, but, um, but, you know, the point is you get sensible information from the pathological cases, which you do not get for any of those um, other, case, other uh, measures. And um, so uh, 
so those were the pathological cases. I think the most interesting of the other cases we came up with in this previous paper are the circle cases. And so for example, the first three are just saying you have two identical circles translated by the same amount, but we're gonna put them in different parts of the field. And ideally your measure would give you the same value for this comparison as it gives for this comparison, as it gives for this comparison. And you can see that mostly they do, uh, like here's mean error distance down here. Um, this is badly delta here. And it's not, it doesn't vary widely and that's because of this uh, mod of, you know, this cutoff function, but um, it, it's not a huge problem, but it does vary depending on where you are in the domain. Um, and so, so you don't want it to do that. Um, the good thing is, you know, this, and I, I'm not going to show any more results from G. I have the circular results in the paper if you're interested, but um, you can see that you get the same value for with this new measure. Uh, so this is actually G beta, even if it says G on the <laughs> on the plot there. But um, but like I said, they're all going to be G beta at this point. So. Um, the, this set of cases here, I'm kind of, uh, I was mainly looking at bias, at least with the first two. Um, so you can see, for example, um, the mean error distance is insensitive to bias in one direction. So if you go from these three circles to the one circle, you get the same value as you got, oh, sorry, that's badly built in where here we are. So the green plus here, you get the same value as you got from those previous circles, which I think, yeah, so from these circles. Um, but if you go in the other direction of the mean error distance, so you look from this circle out, well, this circle is closer to, to these events, so you get a lower value. But it's not you know, like in a way you could hedge that, right? So it's not really a good feature necessarily but uh, for, the, for the mean error distance. Um, and so, so what I wanna show for this G beta is you get a value that's very low for this, this case here. So that's a good thing, right? Because you know, it's heavily biased there. So you want a lower value. Um, as you go up, you don't have as much bias and you get a much higher value, but still not great because it's, you know, it's not that great. Um, now, this next case here is sort of interesting. It's not so much bias, actually, that we're looking at here, but you get a perfect score up here, right? You get this circle exactly, but then you have, again, the same error as before down here. Um, and so, for example, just to look at the badly, let's see, we're over here. Um, so before, you know, you're up around here when you're just comparing these two, but when you're when you compare this third one that's perfect, you get a better score because Baddeley, I, I don't think I said, Baddeley and Hausdorff and mean error distance have a perfect score at zero. And then they, as they increase, it's a worse match. Um, so uh, anyway, the point is, so the Baddeley delta measure uh, rewards you for getting this part right. So you get a better score, you know, than you got over here um, previously. And, and um, whereas G beta does not reward you for getting that right, it gives you the same score. So if I can find it here, yeah, see along here, you get the same score for that one with G beta. So, you know, that's either good or bad, depending on, um, depending on what you care about. And, okay. Uh, this next case, so this is another example where the centroid distance gives you a perfect score for both of these, um, you know, so that we've seen both of these earlier. Um, and so there's your perfect score for those. Um, I don't know that there's much to say here because G beta just is perfectly bad for both of these <laughs> with this choice of beta anyway. Um, so I'm gonna move on from this one. Um, again, another one where centroid distance gives a perfect score here, uh, but, but I want to focus on this one right now. So if you look, and I, and now it's up here, uh, and you can't see it because, or 
because of this thing. Let's see if I can, oh, I can move this, good. <laughs> okay, so this last one here, you get a really good score with the G-beta. And the reason for that is because the beta I chose is a relatively large value. And these are relatively small circles compared to the size of the domain. Um, and you know the reviewers just really didn't like that. Um, but the reason why is because I was actually going for the opposite kind of problem. You know, I, I basically was going for the case where you don't care about small scale um, activity and and um, let's see why isn't it's not going. There we go. <laughs> um, so for example, over here is a forecast. And if you look at the observation field, which I'm not showing, it looks exactly the same to the naked eye, <laughs> okay? Because there's just not that much. I set a, a very high threshold of uh, like, I think 20 millimeters per hour for precipitation. Um, but you, if you blow up this little region down near Louisiana uh, in, uh, I guess this is Alabama and Mississippi, you can see you do have some, what could be severe weather. So you might actually care about these small things. If you care about these small things, well, so, so the first thing to say is that um, in the observation, there are, there are no observations in this area. Um, but there are observations, I think, up in Kansas, maybe, well away from where these are. And um, so there's no matches. There, there, there's misses and there's false alarms, but there are no correct, neg uh, well, there's a lot of correct negatives. There's no correct uh, hits. Hits is the word, yes. Um, so, you know, G beta is going to give you a perfect score on this if you choose you know, the n squared over two, like I was using. Um, Hausdorff dis distance is really great for this case because it's very sensitive to small changes in the field. And, and actually that's the criticism that it got in the binary image metric literature um, was that it's too sensitive to these little things that they didn't care about. Um, but if you're really just interested in small scale phenomena relative to the size of your domain, Hausdorff distance is, is pretty good. It's gonna give you some problems again, you know, maybe with the um, empty field situation. Um, so it turns out though that you can use G beta in this case, because if we take, you know, this is like the largest storm let's call it a storm. You know, I'm not sure if it is or not, but let's call it a storm. Um, if we take the size of this storm and then we say, we don't wanna be off more than, I don't know, a hundred miles or something, then I can multiply that hundred times the area of this thing and, that, and I'll use that for my beta. And if I do that, I get G beta equal to zero for, for the comparison between the observation and this forecast. So my point is that you can get useful information on this type of verification using the G beta. Uh, it just wasn't what I was going for with it. <laughs> and that, you know, so that's just to explain that there. Um, and then just to show further, so this was that case, that last case, um, I put an outline of the C1 to show the relative sizes. So you can see that C1 is much bigger than all four of these put together, these small things. And, and this shows a small choice of beta using the same kind of logic that I used um, just now. And if you use G beta on that, you, with that value of beta. So, so I'm just varying beta, varying beta along the abscissa here and then G beta is on the ordinate. Um, but you get a, a value of zero for that small choice and then, you know, there are all kinds of values in between. And here's the value, whoops, here's the value um, that I showed in the previous thing, which is close to one. Um, and so, you know, so you just have to understand how that, how that works and, and choose your beta appropriately. And just to belabor the point a little more, um, I did a similar exercise as before. So I have the blue circle and then a bunch of different comparisons, but this time, instead of translating, I'm just doing a bias 
So we have smaller circles and then getting larger. And using those same values of beta in that other example, I didn't label it this time, sorry. But um, you can see that you know the bias for most of the choices, even that choice where you chose a way too large number, it eventually tapers off this time. Um, but they actually go down pretty quickly uh, if you have too much bias. And but you can, but if you go to those smaller circles, that they don't really care about it for the larger values because you're getting to smaller scale activity. And but if you choose your beta, that smallest value, that n times square root of n, you do get uh, <laughs> you do get it going down to zero. Um, so good, we're doing well on time because this is the penultimate slide here. Um, so in, rather than doing uh, a summary, you know, the usual list. Um, Manfred Dorninger was uh, an unanonymous reviewer on the last couple iterations of the paper. And, um, you know, he, he gave one or two really good uh, ideas to do. And uh, one was to summarize everything in a table in the summary section. <laughs> and I really liked that idea. And, and this is a more colorful version of that. Um, but basically, you know, so I talked a lot about the pathological cases. So both G and G beta handle that. Um, I don't know why I said depends on beta there, but anyway, <laughs> um, none of those other ones do. Uh, the positional effects, remember, I showed that really only the Baddeley had a problem there. Um, the frequency bias we talked about and in this case, you know, centroid distance has a problem. Hausdorff and mean error distance all have problems with those. Um, they're useful for rare events. So the G, you know, the, the reason I, 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 I said I was going to explain why I put G in there, the, the G I added because the reviewers were giving me a hard time about choosing beta. Um, and so, so G doesn't handle the rare events um, very well. but. Uh, but the G beta does, you know, again, provided you choose your beta appropriately. Um, and then, uh, you know, so centroid distance is not good for rare events. We saw that. Uh, Baddeley's delta is not so good for the rare events because you're just going to get a good score. Um, Hausdorff is great for it. The mean error distance can be, uh, in the paper I did on that, I show an example where you can kind of, you know, there was a small little area and it, it's because of the lack of um, informing you about bias with the mean error distance, but it um, it did pick out a small area of intense precipitation in one of my examples that I didn't realize was there until I did the exercise. So it can be useful there. Um, the, the reward partial match again is this uh, last case here. And, um, basically, the only ones that reward for that are Baddeley's delta and the mean error distance, and, and the mean error distance only because of this asymmetry, so it depends which direction. Um, but you can flip that around and say, well, but do you correctly penalize uh, for despite having a partially perfect match? And so if you turn it around, then, then the G beta is good. Um, and But these others, uh, Let's see, what is it? Centroid, Baddeley's, Hausdorff are not so good at that. Um, and then, um, yeah, so that's the summary. And just as a final uh, kind of note, um, so I, 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 it was suggested, you know, that I do a ranking. I, I was a little bit, um, I, I didn't want to do it just because I, I was kind of tired of working on this paper constantly for the last year because uh, I basically finished it at the beginning of the pandemic and and uh, it the paper actually got published this week so it's uh, quite a, quite a relief but um, I but I'm glad that they pushed me to do the ranking because I I, I think this is a nice result um, for these nine real precipitation cases from a inner comparison project we did you know a decade ago now um, we had a subjective evaluation of you know which where we ranked the 
the nine cases as you know which ones were the best for three different forecasts. I'm showing two here. Um, so the black shows um, which day was ranked what. So like May was ranked number one. Um, looks like 19 May was ranked the worst. Um, I also had done this on an image warping score that in a paper I did a long time ago, uh, and that's shown in the gray. I did in this paper, I did another G where I did a, I incorporated the, I, I actually had a couple of them, I incorporated the intensity information in a distributional way. Um, and that's the light blue, but G beta is the dark blue. Uh, didn't do G on this one, um, but, Let's see, so what you look at is first, so the caveats are first of all, our subjective evaluation was dubious at best. Um, you know, everybody, there was a lot of variability in, in the answers. So these are like the average ranking, um, but you can see for ARW, <laughs> there are some um, wide disagreements uh, about which one is best and worst, but you can see for the most part, the the G and the, let's see, what is the, the gray? Um, they, they kind of follow the image warping rankings, especially down here, um, more than you might expect. And, and some of that can also be that the image warp ranking is off, you know, so, so it's hard to really, and that was my reluctance in doing it, but, um, but, it, but it does give you some hope that, you know, it's giving you the kind of information you want to you have. And uh, I guess at that, I will end and entertain questions if there are any. So thank you, Eric. Um, and so, yeah, please enter questions in on the Slido, which is right below your, um, your live stream window. Um, so please, please get those in. And I guess we'll, we'll start off with a question from John Halley Gottway, who's, who writes, Hi, Eric. Since G beta is based on mean error distance, I assume we could add this to MET by adding new columns to the existing D map or distance map output line type from MET's GridStat tool. Is that correct? Yes. Um, it should be very easy because it, you know, we already have the distance maps in MET. Um, so, and we actually, I think, have. You know, we have the binary fields as well. So it's just a matter of summing up, you know, well, well yeah, and you have the mean error distance, uh, but for that, that Y1 term, I, I think we even, we might even report that information. I don't remember, but, but, I, it, but yes, it's very easy to get the information for Y1 and, and um, Y2 is just the two mean error distances um, with the size of those two sets, which would be easy to get. So um, you'd have to add for the G beta, you know, you'd have to add the user parameter there. Um, but yeah, I, I, it should be very, very simple to add. And, and I'd be happy to write something for the tutorial if you need. Okay, um, yeah, while well, we wait, for, wait to see if there are any other questions that pop in, um, I just have a, I have a question, Eric, on your, last slide, uh, your, your summary slide uh, with showing these relative rankings. Um, so I guess what, you, you had a ranking from one to nine, but what, what does that, what did that mean? Yeah, so one is best. <laughs> so I, I think you can see it again, right? I put it up, I was told I could do that. <laughs> okay, yeah, so, so the rank is on here. So low values are better. <laughs> <laughs> right, so nine is worst, one is best, and then all the points in between. So say one, two, three, four, you know, yeah. So um, for example, these three methods agreed that 19 May was the best for the NMM model. And whereas subjectively we thought, or, you know, the consensus <laughs> in some sense was that 26 April was the best. Um, so, whereas this one was like about five or six, it looks like six. Yeah. So that's the way to interpret it. So I, when I say they agree, I'm just kind of looking at how high are those bars and are they, are they generally similar? There was more disagreement on ARW, I think, but, but you can see a lot of cases where, 
um, these three colors uh, are, you know, generally, you know, not in every case, but they're gen they generally agree about, you know, how relatively how good is each uh, forecast. And and like I say, you know, there there could be an issue with the image warp result. <laughs> you know, I don't I, I don't remember, um, but but yeah. So it, so you can't take you don't want to read too much into <laughs> this plot, but it does give some sense that there's some consistency. Um, I, I know we only have five minutes left, but I wanted to make sure that um, everybody can uh, hear this, that congratulations again on, on getting the, the paper um, <laughs> published. And I, I, I realize sometimes you go up against reviewers that may not fully grasp the concept. Um, uh, but anyway, thanks for persevering. And uh, it, it's important to get this statistical, uh, you know, uh, what, what can I say? Um, realizability uh, assessments in, in our models, uh, more than just maybe what meteorologists might have uh, relied on in the past, but actually making this very robust. So I can see there's another question and I'll just uh, be quiet. I just wanted to make that congratulations known. Yeah, thanks. So um, our next question is from Erin Towler. Hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, she, uh, she asks, for hydrology applications, we're often interested in how much overlap there is for a forecast OBS over a particular contributing watershed and less interested in the verification outside it. Could you mask this analysis for that application? Yeah, I mean, you can put it on, you know, whatever domain you want. Um, the, the fast algorithm for computing the, the distance measures uh, is kind of a, a regular grid focused thing, but you could, you could do the distance map on the whole thing and then mask out the part that you're interested in and then do these summaries. But yeah, I don't see any issues there. Okay, um, I don't don't see any other questions coming in on the Slido just yet, and um, we're approaching the top of the hour. So, um, yeah, I think we're gonna we'll, we'll go ahead and end the seminar now. This um, this recording will be posted um, up um, up on the RAL website. I'm not sure how exactly how quickly, but it will be up there so that you can uh, view this later on your own time if you missed any of the references. Or, or DOIs for any of the papers that Eric mentioned. Um, but yeah, once again, thank you, Eric, for a really interesting, um, uh, interesting seminar. And also congratulations on, on getting that paper published oh, and through the review process. <laughs> I'll, I'll thank Eric once again, because we, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I'll thank Eric once again, because we talked about, hey, this might be a good RAL seminar. And then we reached out to Jared and, and Jenny helped, of course. So. Um, Thanks to, um, you know, despite our circumstances now, we're still continuing a nice seminar series um, and uh, providing a lot of good science uh, that we can share with uh, the rest of RAL and others. So thank you. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone. See you. Bye.